Far in the east, like a brilliant teardrop falling out of China's eye, there is a city like nowhere else, a storybook city, except nobody is certain yet how the story will come out. The West helped to create this magic place, and now the East wants it back. As the mighty battle between two cultures enters its final phase, a man arrives who bridges them both. What will he find here? A ghost town that has lost heart in the face of the looming threat of history? Or a boom town whose busy, bubbling spirit not even anxiety can crush? And what made him think he could ever master Kung Fu? Hong Kong Kai-Tak International Airport. Getting set to land, I was feeling apprehensive. Pilots rate the approach to Hong Kong Airport as the nearest thing to compulsory early retirement. I had paid brief visits to Hong Kong before and always wondered whether the plane was actually going to make it between the crowded apartment blocks or whether I would abruptly join the busy people I could see through the windows snatching a quick bowl of noodles while they watched television. In my mind, the burning question of whether Hong Kong would survive was replaced by another question. Would I? To my great relief, we touched down on the airstrip instead of in the middle of somebody's lunch break. But a deeper fear remained. The city had only a few hundred days left before the lease ran out and the hard men from the mainland took over. They have always regarded Hong Kong as a den of capitalist decadence. Maybe they've got a point. Hong Kong has more Rolls Royces per capita than anywhere else in the world, and my hotel sent me one as a pick-me-up. The driver doubled as a butler. I'm going. The hot towel was high quality, steamed like a dumpling, fluffy as a feather boa. It had everything except an Yves Saint Laurent monogram. There are six million people crammed into Hong Kong, and not all of them have Rolls Royces. But up there in the bulging apartment blocks, nobody has any plans to stay poor. They're here to make it. Outside in the humidity, Rolls royceless but ambitious workaholics are calling their stockbrokers. The dialect is Cantonese, but the language is money. Money was how the whole thing started, and it looked as if it was still pouring in. Hong Kong's physical expansion showed no signs of having slowed down since I was here last. On the contrary, Half of the tallest towers in the city had turned into the shortest. At the hotel, the automatic door opener was Chinese. But the concierge was Italian. Foreign staff are there to make foreigners feel at home. It's been going on since the British banks came out here in the last century to supply the mainland with Indian opium and another drug even more deadly, loans. The loans generated debt as night follows day, and the lucky British got a long lease on Hong Kong at a knockdown price as part of the payoff. So to China, and especially to communist China, tiny Hong Kong became a bigger insult the more it boomed. And the boom goes on. You can practically hear it. As you look out across the harbor towards China in the north, the few bits of land you can see are almost all Hong Kong is. The rest is water, which is steadily being filled in to make room for more buildings, more people, more everything. Nothing is diminishing except British influence. The flag under which the whole upsurge began is looking a trifle tatty. Jet-lagged but curious, I set out to renew contact with the mysterious East, but it seemed to have vanished. In the central district, even the footpaths have moved into the air. The well-heeled can go shopping for hours without ever touching the ground. 
the Western brand name boutiques have proliferated at such a biological rate that they've coalesced into shopping malls. It's like Rodeo Drive up there. Once, the people of Hong Kong only dreamed about the West. This new generation look as if they're living in it, except that their version is clean. The pacey young number crunchers with the mobile phones aren't getting mugged for them. The school children have books in their satchels. This is the Western ideal of the consumer society with all the aggro taken out. But where was the mysterious East? Where were the barefoot noodle vendors in conical hats? There had to be something of the mysterious East left somewhere. I saw a rickshaw driver who looked as if he might know where it was, but he was busy talking to the Singapore Stock Exchange before it closed. Left to my own resources, the first place I thought of looking was on the other side of the harbour. From time immemorial, the chugging, quivering old star ferry has joined Hong Kong Island to the Kowloon side. It's just too romantic to shut down. There are tunnels under the harbour, but they haven't got the view. Even more so than just a few years ago, Hong Kong looks like Manhattan. If it wasn't in the east, it would be in the west. But Kowloon still looks like the East. Most of the neon is in Chinese. When the communists take over in 1997, they might just possibly turn this whole area into a collective farm. But until then, nobody's going to stop grafting. Though the emigration figures are up, immigration never stops. For refugees in this part of the world, this is still the place to breathe free air, get ahead, raise their children, eat their fill. It suddenly occurred to me that I had last eaten seriously somewhere over the Gobi Desert. Hello, sir. Usually I prefer my Chinese food in a metal foil box with a cardboard still lid alive. and a plastic spoon. He's still alive. Yeah, really good. Ah, he's still alive too. Here it looked a bit too fresh for my taste. Any fresher and you'd have to fight it for your life. It all looked a bit X-Files, but I was ready to give it a try. Hi, can you, uh, Demonstrating uh, my mastery of the Cantonese uh, language, uh, acquired from a tape called Instant Cantonese, I ordered something that sounded as if it might have been granted the mercy of death before it was cooked, and played for safety by asking for a side order of rice. When my main dish came, something in it was blowing bubbles, so I decided to put it off until never. The rice looked relatively safe. Everybody else seemed to be eating it too, so I didn't feel that I was dodging the issue. I fancied that I was fitting in, like an old China hand. Then I noticed a strange thing. A crowd of spectators had formed. For a while I thought they had stopped by to laugh at my chopstick technique, but eventually I overheard the word pang. Chris Patton, the famously well-fed governor of Hong Kong, is universally known as Fat Pang. Perhaps this crowd had decided that I was his even more well-built cousin, Fatter Pang. I was struck with the urge to be alone. I chose the wrong place to hide. In recent years, Hong Kong has been cranking out cut-rate high-tech goods in such quantity that the Temple Street night market has been transformed. Now it's got calculators and digital watches the way it used to have mother-of-pearl inlaid souvenir chopstick sets and ginseng. It was like wading through an electronic avalanche. I was especially impressed with the watches. The man selling them assured me that the one I liked the look of was solid gold and cost a hundred Hong Kong dollars. At around ten dollars to the pound sterling, that meant I could own a solid gold watch for ten pounds. Barely had I performed this lightning calculation before he told me that he could knock off another twenty dollars for a quick sale at a total cost to me of eight pounds. Or let's make it seven because my star sign was the same as his mother's. Something told me this deal was a bit too good to be true. What I was really after was a mobile phone. Obviously, you were dead in Hong Kong unless you had one. There were dozens of different customized phone systems to choose from. More immediately attractive for my purposes 
There were mobile phones of every size from small to microscopic. I had always wanted a mobile small enough not to attract London's growing army of muggers, and this looked like it. Drawing once again on my mastery of the Cantonese language, I haggled with the lady in charge over the price. I understood her to say that the thing had an incredible performance, considering its total cost, batteries included, of five pounds sterling, and I could start using it straight away. She wasn't quite right about the incredible performance. There was a lot of howling static before I heard the BBC World Service. Yes, it was a transistor radio. Something had gone wrong with the woman's Cantonese, but I tried not to hold it against her. Next morning, I woke up to the rush hour, which lasts most of the day. Here was the first of Asia's post-World War II tiger economies, still going full blast. Let the British make the laws while we make the money. That used to be the spirit. Then 1997 started to loom, with the threat of being absorbed by China, which doesn't much like laws or money. The anxiety should have spelled paralysis, yet somehow it hasn't. Judging from the bustle, they still believe in tomorrow. But it can't be denied that yesterday has the quirky, laid-back charm. Down at the water's edge, you can see how Hong Kong used to be before it went frantic. Hong Kong means fragrant harbour, and down here it still lives up to its name. The fragrance of fish guts takes you back into the past like a rusty hook. Any reasonably experienced haggler sampan. could fix himself a sampan ride for only a few dollars. A haggler with my gifts can soon get the price up to twice as much. I pay you later? Yes. Okay. I was promised an hour of luxurious relaxation, previously enjoyed only by the mad first emperor of the Qin on his swan-powered royal barge. The sampan's owner handed me over to its driver, who turned out to be her grandmother. I could tell she liked me. Out on the water, Hong Kong's original nature reveals itself. The city began as a port with junks and sampans. Most of the old romantic craft are now permanently shorebound, doubling as houseboats, gold watch factories and crab cleaning facilities. But hundreds of sampans are still puttering about with the harbour's minor cargo and any visitor who wants a low-stress tour of the waterfront, complete with running commentary. I couldn't understand much of what she said, apart from the swear words. Luckily, I had a pretty clear idea of the sort of thing I wanted to see. With an expert finger, I pointed out where I wanted to go. I said, go over there, in Cantonese. For some reason, she heard this as go hell for leather. The engine must have had something special done to it. Fuel injection, perhaps. <laughs> With a surge of power, we almost T-boned a passing prawn trawler. Then she really started treading on the gas. She started charging other boats. Some of them were much bigger than ours. It got to the point where I had to tell her that I wanted to get off. Once again, failing to understand her own language, she took me to mean that I had spotted an enemy boat. She turned up the boost and charged. Luckily, the roof only half fell in. For my driver, it was apparently an everyday occurrence. She confined herself to routine curses. But I felt grateful. I had learned a valuable lesson about the Hong Kong waterfront, study it from photographs. I said goodbye with the traditional oriental gesture of thanks.